This series was funded by great viewers just like you over on Patreon. Check out the description or end of the video to hear how you can take part in making the show even more amazing. Hey everyone, Gaichin Goomba here, and welcome to another episode of Witch Ninja! A series that looks at media's most popular shinobi to see which are good, which are bad. So, Dungeons and Dragons, you've heard of it, right? A bunch of nerds sitting around a card table in the basement playing pretend? At least, that was the general disposition people had until it exploded into one of the most popular forms of streaming entertainment. In a post-critical role world, D&D has become more and more of a household name with other groups hitting the limelight, like High Rollers, Maze Arcana, and Adventure Zone. To the point where I'm wondering when this tabletop bubble is gonna burst. But for the time being, I think it's fair to say that Dungeons & Dragons has been formed into one of the great pillars of popular online media, right? So, do we got ninjas? And I don't mean homebrew build-it-yourself archetypes of prestige classes, I'm talking player's handbook official ninjas. Technically no, but despite that, I honestly think it's 100% possible to make one. And not the BS unstoppable, invincible killing machines that popular media loves to postulate. I mean real ninja, based on hundreds of years of recorded history and folklore as recounted in such texts as the Bansen Shukai, Shouninki, and the Shinobi Hiden. See, for the last two years now, every Wednesday at 9pm US Central, I've been a part of another D&D Twitch group known as the Unexpectables, starring Tass the Cobalt Ranger, played by Christopher Zito, Borky the Orc Barbarian, played by Curtis Takahana 101 Arnott, Panic the Tiefling Bard, played by Connor Distortion Devil McKinley, our extremely talented DM extraordinaire Monty Glue, and Greckles the Kinku Rogue, played by, well, yours truly. Like I said, two years back we all came together and started up the idea of the Unexpectables and tried to figure out what we would play. Which also happened to be the golden age of Witch Ninja. So, being the shinobi obsessed Japanophile that I am, I really, really wanted to make as close to an authentic ninja as I could while keeping within the limitations of the core rulebook. And the result? Well, that's exactly what I want to talk about today. And apparently so do my patrons. Guys, I know I have teased this for a long time, but I am so glad I'm finally able to do this. So whether you're a fan of the Unexpectables, a fan of ninja history and culture, or just a shinobi fan like myself who wanted to build their own in D&D, for today's episode of Witch Ninja, I wanted to explain the historically fueled inspiration I had in building the unofficial blue blur, Greckles. So let's start at the basis of beginnings, race. The first step of making any D&D character is usually choosing what race you want to be. From big old goliaths and half dragons to the diminutive halflings and gnomes, and for me, in my quest to build the ultimate authentic ninja, I had to go Kenku. I mean, for one, the D&D race of the Kenku is derivative from the folklore creature Tengu, which if you saw my last two videos, you know everything about, but if not, Tengu were mostly birthed from the esoteric religion of Shugendo, mountain monks who mixed the traditions of Buddhism with the animism and mysticism of Shinto to create a system of self-empowering through nature. And it was the Yamabushi that taught many ninja clans their mystic arts of self-empowering in the Heian period of the late 700s, evident from the statue of Inno Gyoja, the father of Shugendo being prominently placed in Iga's ninja museum. But there's more to Kenku than just the name and the Birdman appearance. Kenku have two incredibly useful features that any ninja would have given their left arm for, mimicry and expert forgery. Being birds, their entire form of verbal communication is done through mimicking the speech of other races. Therefore, Kenku can not only sound like anyone they want, but also anything they want. In the Bansen Shukai, a mass collection of Koga and Iga ninja techniques and philosophies, in Volume 8, Yonin 1, under six points of laying plans, there is extensive talk about the need to not only look and behave, but sound like the kind of person you're pretending to be, a simple feat for the mimicking Kenku. For Greckles in game, he had to take on the guise of a pirate named Fletch aboard the skyship known as the Talon, using said impersonation to not only figure out how to free his friends, but also how to befriend another of the pirates named Kiwi and learn everything he could about how the ship functioned. However, a Kenku would also be more than capable of mimicking the sounds of animals, a signal tactic that was highly used by Shinobi for team communication, and you better believe it was useful in game. Then there's the Kenku's expert forgery the ability to gain advantage on all checks made to reproduce duplicates or forgeries of existing objects. Which would be another covetable ability that any ninja would love. Going back to the Bonsen Shukai Volume 11, Enin under 10 points to consider before a mission, quote, Be fully aware of the possibility that you may be detected while discreetly collecting information on the happenings within the enemy army. With that information, you should forge letters from some of the enemy staff and address them to your lord. Then in Volume 8, Yonin, or Open Disguise, under the six points of laying plans, you need to acquire and keep copies of the marks and seals of the lords of various castles, 
you should always try to obtain the seals of castle lords or generals for the case where you need to forge letters to incriminate a target for conspiracy. Yeah, safe to say, giving a ninja any sort of advantage on forgery creation would be one of the biggest boons they could receive. But there's one important thing to consider. Kinku can be literally any kind of bird in existence, so which one do you choose? Well, for me, that was the Texas-based Great-Tailed Grackle. You mean the irritatingly loud laser birds? Seriously, these things are aggressive and ear-piercing with their calls. <laughs> Why would you want something that loud for a sneaky ninja? Well, grackles have a very unique plumage that can melt between very dark and light navy blue depending on how the light hits it. And what have we always said on this show? Oh, I see. Real ninja bear blue. Because when silhouetted against the night sky, a ninja in black is always going to be far easier to see than a ninja in navy blue. Shoot, with one's entire body said navy blue, you wouldn't even really have to worry about covering pale skin. Well, that's the idea. So let's move on to class, and yeah, this is a no-brainer. You go rogue. Advanced mobility and stealth with cunning action, the ability to dodge out of damage through evasion and uncanny dodge, the insane levels of d6 worth of damage added to your sneak attack, you are built to strike hard and fade away without a trace. Or, in the case of Greckles, in many, many instances, sneak in and get the job done. See, unlike a lot of D&D rogues, a rogue with a ninja mindset isn't mindlessly focused on stealing everything in sight and kidney shotting every enemy they physically can. You have the ability to sneak your way in, especially with a group creating a distraction and getting the objective done. I've thumbed through the Bansen Shukai and Shouniki cover to cover, and only once or twice do they ever talk about combat tactics. In fact, there are even more sections about how to befriend and manipulate your enemy rather than to fight them. So if you're trying to be a real ninja, don't be that rogue. Next, we gotta consider something that's very, very important. Archetypes. Unique specializations that allow each class to be even better at the things that they're already good at. For rogues, there's the assassin archetype, which lets you kill better, the thief, which lets you steal better, and the arcane trickster, which, in my personal opinion, is the best selection when trying to make a real ninja in D&D. Wait, 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 wait. The archetype that lets you cast spells? Are you saying that illusion and enchantment spells in dungeons and freaking dragons would make for passable shinobi jutsus? I know it sounds dumb, but you better believe it does. Granted, you have a fairly big list of spells to choose from, but let me line out the ones that I thought would make the best jutsus. First, the cantrips, the stuff you can use at will. For Greckles, that's Minor Illusion, Mage Hand, and Firebolt. Mage Hand allows you to create an invisible force that does everything a single hand could do for about 30 feet. That includes picking up, putting down, planting traps, picking pockets, picking locks, everything ninja were extensively trained to do, but now with a 30 foot buffer. Come standard with the archetype. Then there's Minor Illusion, and this goes basically with any core illusion spell. Ninja had a specialization in what's known as Genjutsu. No, not that Naruto crap. Genjutsu translated as vision technique were little more than tricks of the eye similar to that of professional magicians. Though unmentioned in shinobi text, there are examples of ninja figures that use said trickery to interesting effects. There was Kato Danzo, a freelance shinobi of the early 1550s who mastered street illusions such as appearing to have swallowed a whole cow eventually gaining the attention of the legendary Uesugi Kenshin and Takeda Shingen for more strategic use of his skills. In any case, despite how overpowered Genjutsu illusions have become over the last hundred years, even in their base form, they were still critical for the ninja. Then there's Firebolt, and oh boy, did ninja love their fire. Used in their tools, used in their weapons, used in their communication. We'll get to specifics later, but let me just say that the Bonsen Shukai alone not only has over two dozen tools that utilize fire, but in Volume 12, Inin 2, there are six unique points to the art of arson, including where to set fire, how to set fire, how to subdivide attention between fires to keep them from being put out, and how to prove to the ninja's boss that the deed was done using fire. Even according to the Ikan Ninja Museum in Japan, the very specialty of the clan was fire, which can be seen in all the guns, explosives, and other flaming weapons displayed at the museum. As for Greckles in game though, Fireball did some damage from time to time, but the one instance that the spell was its most helpful was during a trek in the Underdark when the crew got ambushed by some chitins in their web. But by torching the web, it distracted the humanoid spiders just enough to get away, and in similar fashion did Arson help the ninja sabotage and escape. Now we're getting to the level 1 spells, and for Greckles, that's Disguise Self, Illusionary Script, Silent Image, and Fog Cloud. For Silent Image, see everything above that we just explained with Genjutsu. But Illusionary Script, that's an interesting choice. Basically making a written piece of parchment appear to be unintelligible to anyone that the caster doesn't designate. 
Seems like an oddball spell to take for a D&D shinobi. If it weren't for the fact that ninja had their own secret written language. It's true. Shinobi had unique forms of writing called Himitsumoji, or secret characters, which utilize ancient written scripts modeled after knotted ropes. Unintelligible scratch and gibberish to everyday people, but a highly effective liaison coding for the ninja. Then there's Fog Cloud, a spell that lets you create a 20-foot cube of fog anywhere within 100 feet, which, when looking at the spell from a shinobi point of view, could have a few different inspirations. Ah, so you mean like the straight-up Muto no Jutsu, or literally fog seclusion technique. A ten-ton jipo technique that had the ninja utilizing natural phenomena, ninja would capitalize on the low visibility of a fog blanketing an infiltration point in order to easily sneak in or out of an area. Well, sure, but fog cloud as a spell could also be used in the same way shinobi would utilize man-made smoke, such as Torinoko smoke bombs. The one thing to consider, though, is that more often than not, a ninja would use a smoke-producing technique to initiate a confrontation, not necessarily run from one. Nothing could beat a smoke screen for a shinobi's entry. And for Greckles in combat, Fog Cloud very effectively has been able to distract groups of enemies long enough for the party to pick off more powerful threats. Such was the case with a few fights during the monstrous culling arc at Humbrack Village with Ana and Thomas for you Unexpectables fans out there. Next there's Disguise Self, which you'd think would be pretty self-explanatory, right? It's a disguise, what's there to get? But what's interesting about how Ninja handled the task was how detailed they would go in terms of how to properly disguise themselves. The greatest example of this being the Shichi Holde, or Seven Ninja Disguises. Those being the guise of a Komuso monk, a Yamabushi monk, a Hokashi street performer, traveling Shuke monk, a Shonin merchant, a Sarugakushi theatrical performer, or a Tsunin no Nari, your average Joe. But that didn't limit a ninja's capability of disguise to just those seven forms. They would use more subtle techniques such as using cloth padding to widen their face, draw wrinkles and moles to make themselves look older, master the arts of cross-dressing, or even the utilization of mud in order to change their complexion. Again, the Bonsen Shukai Volume 8 Yonin is packed with information on the subtleties of changing one's identity. Finally, there's the Level 2 spells, and this is where you start to get into some of the more potent stuff in the game, but still no less translatable into Shinobi Jutsus, with Mirror Image being a great example. A spell that allows you to create three illusions of yourself that require special dice rolls for the enemy to hit the actual you. So, basically the Bushin no Jutsu, or Alter Ego technique. The one technique that every ninja in media seems to have. Yeah, we talk about this one a lot on the show, but to sum up its origins in traditional ninjutsu, there were three ways that legends told that this technique worked. One, it was thought that the ninja could move so fast that it would literally create after images that the human eye would track. And yeah, not so sure about the logical rationale on that one, but the other two could work in theory. The second is that ninjas were thought to create literal straw men, placing them in strategic locations to fool guards and patrols into thinking that the ninja was in several places at once, or just simply draw unwanted fire. And lastly, it was believed that small task force of ninja would dress and act identical with each other in order to confuse and prevent guards from accurately reporting the location of the intruding shinobi. And the last of the level 2 spells is Invisibility, which, again, no duh, of course a ninja would want to be invisible. But in a very real way, ninja were historically able to accomplish such a feat with a very unique trick. The Uzura Gakure no Jutsu, or Quail Hiding Technique. Founded in the Bonsen Shukai and named after the bird whose behavior inspired the technique, long story short, the ninja would tuck in their arms, legs, and their faces deep into their core and use breathing techniques to rapidly slow down their pulse and heart rate completely unmoving even if struck. Behind cover or in low light, the shape and color of the ninja would actually fool pursuers into thinking that they were little more than a medium-sized rock. Besides, what kind of person would instinctively curl up into a ball and sit in a field? Normal people would be looking for places to physically hide, right? Well, not the ninja. Lastly, as far as spells in general go, I usually flavor Greco's somatic components or movement evocations as the Kuji-in. Nine separate hand signs that have gone from esoteric Buddhist meditation focuses to fantasy chakra invoking magic. But don't be fooled by Naruto and the like. Dr. Teruhisa Komori at Mie University did extensive testing on the effects of the Kuji-in, and found that people who executed the nine gestures while chanting their names did actually have reduced stress and greater focus when put under intense situations. So while the Kuji-in may not evoke fireballs from our bodies, they have acted as catalysts to reset the human mind to execute insane tasks under huge volumes of stress. And that's about as far as spells go in terms of shinobi inspiration in D&D. Wow, that was a lot. Anyway guys, thanks for- We're not done yet, because now we got items to talk about. We still got more? I told you, there's a lot of true-to-life shinobi inspiration that went behind Greckles, and even more that could apply to other D&D characters as well. Granted, weapons should be pretty self-explanatory, 
Short swords representing the common use Koldachi for the ninja, darts representing the different flavors of bow and shotgun style shuriken, daggers as tanto or kunai, sickles as kama, but the one thing that a ninja never did was view their weapons as nothing more than a pony thing to hurt the enemy. Every weapon a ninja had had some sort of duality in its utility. At the moment in game, Greckles possesses a Sunblade as a main weapon, which is not only useful for alternate damage typing, but having 60 feet of pure sunlight not only saved the party's bacon against the vampires of Tracadia, but also helped navigate the pitch black Underdark. But even mundane weapons can have crazy utility. A tied off sickle could be used as a grappling hook, a shuriken could act as an anchor, and the stereotypical ninja toe? Man, what couldn't that thing do? Records say that its wide square tsuba could be used as a step stool, the excessive space in the saya could hold small items and powders, the rope tied to the saya could be used as a makeshift tripwire, and the sword itself could be used to navigate dark places slowly. Point being, if you want to roll a real ninja in D&D, don't neglect the potential that even simple weapons have. Your DM will praise you for critically thinking and being creative. Outside of weapons and armor, there were six items in particular that I made sure Greckles wasn't without. A tinderbox, a grappling hook with a rope, chalk and parchment, a really wide traveler's hat, at least three different kinds of potions, and I kid you not, a towel. These six items mirror the true life shinobi no Rokuku, six critical ninja tools that no shinobi would be without. Found within the Shouninki Volume 1 under the Shinobi Detachi no Narai, or Equipment and Outfits for Shinobi Activities, these were the Amigasa Wide Brim Weather Hat, a Kaginawa Grappling Hook, a Sekihitsu Chalk Pin, Field medication in the form of General Kusuri kept in an Indo container, the Uchitake or Hinata tinderbox and sparking tools, and finally, the Sanjaku Tenugi, a simple three-foot towel. While an Amigasa helps pull the look of Greckles together, the one really valuable thing it can do is hide your face from the general public while looking like you're merely trying to shield your face from falling rain or the harsh sun, helping you stay more stealthy. The Kaginawa? Good lord I can't tell you guys how many times I've used this thing. From helping the party navigate the Underdark to crossing a wide chasm with billowing winds to the far east of Alavast, if you don't have a grappling hook, you're doing your party a disservice. How about Kasuri in the form of potions? Well, D&D players should already get this, but rogues have a low hit die and are usually glass cannons. They can dish out some crazy damage, but they sure as heck can't take it. And to the same extent, so are ninja. Mostly unarmored and usually only lightly armed, ninja weren't built for a sustained fight. But more than that, Shinobi simply didn't carry around medications for the body, but also carried around situational drugs like bug repellent, clotting agents, and antidotes. So a good D&D ninja should be carrying around medicines for all manner of issues. Poison resist, cure pots, oil of slipperiness. Have a good stock of various concoctions. I think it goes without saying how important a flint box would be. Not just for survival like creating campfires, but as we talked about with the firebolt spell, arson for the ninja was an extremely critical tool for both espionage and distraction, as seen in the Bonsen Chukai's six points of arson. And the same goes for Sekihitsu Chalk. A ninja always had to be ready to take information, and to anyone who's ever played D&D, the same can be said. In the case of Greckles in game, the party found tons of different symbols, characters, and markings that proved inviolable to the current quest while they scoured the Underdark. Having something to take notes with in-game was priceless. Finally, you'd think a towel would be pretty dumb to have, but it's surprisingly useful. For a ninja, it could be used as a face wrap against smoke or bad weather, used as a rope extension, a trip wire if bound tight. Again, the thing that really made ninja what they were was their creativity in using their tools to the greatest potential. Other than those six, you sure as heck are gonna need thieves tools. I mean, ninja sure did, and they had a good number of options. Shinobi have been cited in using a ton of different tools to break and enter, such as the Kuroro Kagi, a sort of skeleton key specially made for opening storehouse padlocks, but when they couldn't pick their way through, Ninja would utilize Karakuri Kagi and Banno Kagi, folding chisels that could very subtly cut locks themselves. And Caltrops, boy, howdy can you not go without Caltrops! Considering they're only one gold per five foot square, there's no reason for a good D&D Ninja not to have them. For Greckles, they were so important that he had custom silver ones made in the case of supernatural enemies. But for the traditional ninja, the water chestnut wind dried made for more than an adequate makibishi as they were called. There's just one important note to take into consideration when using these things in game though. Despite what we see in media, no one is actually dumb enough not to see makibishi being dropped by a pursued ninja. Especially if they're an eye shot. I've never seen a good DM play an NPC that stupid to completely ignore the player character doing something like that. However, Makibishi Caltrops were an amazing way for a ninja to deny areas of entry and exit when the shinobi needed to escape. Only they knew where it was safe to walk, and this strategy served me well in-game. 
During the finale fight of The Calling and the final fight in the realm of Discord and the Unexpectables, Maki Bishi Caltrops were able to slow down incoming enemies to half their speed, which was an insane advantage the party was able to exploit. But again, they're a precautionary tool, not a reactionary one. Finally, there's poisons, which in D&D is surprisingly hard to get a hold of considering they're typically illegal substances. But don't forget that you can likely find harmful substances in the wild that can help you and your party. Heck, in the show Ninki, there's mention of Machin, which was one of the ninja's favorite poisons taken from strychnine and tree seeds. Other poisons could be taken from natural resources like pufferfish, apple seeds, plum seeds, and Amanita mushrooms. All of which they could literally find in their backyards. And for the love of god, do not limit yourself to using just conventional poisons. In game, the Unexpectables have been fighting a great deal of demons and other extra planar creatures as of late. And coating a blade with holy water was far more potent than an underbelly sold poison. Again, good ninja are always creative and flexible. Finally, something even as small as Chosen Feats had a ton of historical inspiration when it came to building Greckles as a ninja. And for him, there was no better feat than mobile. Increasing base speed by 10 feet, able to run through rough terrain with no problem, and being able to hit and run without getting hit back. In my research, aside from pure survivability, nothing was more important to a historical ninja than the ability to move fast for long periods of time. I mean, think about it. Most ninja traveled on foot to stay stealthy, and getting to and from the clan base to your target meant dozens and dozens of miles of travel. It wasn't only important for a ninja to be fast at escaping, but also general travel, and it seemed that each ninja school had their own method of achieving this. For example, the Togakure school trained their running by having a student run upwards of 80 to 100 miles while keeping a hat pressed against their chest purely from wind pressure, as well as long runs carrying heavy items like water buckets. Eh, I know about that one, Chief. And the Iga Ninja had their own technique of running called Namba Running, wherein instead of running with arms and legs alternating, they move in unison, reducing twisting and swinging to reduce exhaustion. So yeah, when it comes to feats for a true ninja in D&D, ultimate control of movement and speed are pretty paramount to both escape and navigate the battlefield. Are... are you done now? It's been over 20 minutes. Hey, like I said, there was a lot of ninja inspiration that went to my boy Greckles, and there's far more that players could do to expand on the idea even further. Just remember, like historical ninja, you're not invincible. You're gonna screw up. You're gonna roll natural ones. Trust me, you're gonna roll a lot of natural ones. You will completely screw up the plan that you laid out and you'll have to figure out what to do next. But you just gotta be smart about what you do. As the Bansen Shukai says in volume 11 under the first Enin, the three diseases of Shinobi no Jutsu are to fear, to take the enemy lightly, and to think too much. Be smart, be fluid, and take calculated risks. But if you want to see this stuff in action as well as catch one of the most humorous, action-packed, and creative D&D games on the internet, swing on by every Wednesday at 9pm on Twitch, or if you can't make it, check out the Unexpectables podcast. If you've been looking for a new series to listen to, we have over a hundred episodes of adventures, japes, and some of the best world building you will ever see. But as always everyone, thanks for watching, and a big thank you to all my patrons who voted on this topic. I've been so freaking ready to break down Greckles and introduce my other passion project to my viewers, so thanks for letting me go at it. And to all of the Unexpectables fan artists, I absolutely cannot thank you guys enough for the dozens of contributions you gave for this. You guys made this episode. We got plenty of other episodes of Witch Ninja breaking out Shinobi from all kinds of popular media, but our focus for this channel has always been the edutainment of Japanese culture through everything from video games to movies to anime and beyond. So if that sounds like your kind of jam, be sure to subscribe. Otherwise, I hope to see you guys over on my stream every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7pm US Central. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.